Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Okay, I don't know if you hear me through the microphone. Or it's my loud voice that's, uh, that's coming through. But either way, yes, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be in conversation for the next 45 to 50 minutes with Nadez Omer, who's, um, you might wonder, on the subject of, subject of Igbo spirituality in contemporary Nigeria, you might wonder, looking at this young man, what his credentials are. I will leave him to be a bit more expansive by his responses to the questions I've put together for him. Uh, I think that's the greatest test of whatever knowledge or qualifications he has to deal with the subject. Suffice it to say that for 36 years, I've known his family and uh, I've known the legacy of knowledge that that family carries, particularly his father, who in my eyes is a legend. So I will declare an interest now. You know, uh, he is a legend in my eyes, a man whose scholarship I have followed for many years, apart from his core area of estate management, but his gravitas in spirituality, Igbo spirituality and Igbo cosmology is second to none. Uh, so it is a privilege for me to have a conversation with him. Um, it was meant to be his brother, but there's, you know, Moses is brother of Musu, as we say. <laughs> so, um, Nedozi, thank you very much. And um, we've had a bit of a journey getting here because don't be fooled by his uh, gentle look. He was very exacting about what the conversation should be like. We had to have a structure because for both of us, it's not a joke. It's a very, very serious subject. So please join us. Um, we'll, I'll put a few questions to him which give him a landscape, a football field to, to travel. And then subsequent to the questions, we'll throw uh, the questions open to the floor to, um, to answer. So we're gonna, um, I'll, I'll, I'll work with him for 30 minutes. And then so the last uh, 20 minutes, I'll leave to the audience. Now, if we finish earlier, well, more power to you. So, now, now there's a, my first question, yes. Igbo spirituality. <laughs> when people see that, I'm sure people who read the program will have thought, hmm, idolatry, idol worship. Are they, are they right? Are they right? Well, um, I hope you can hear me. I am so sorry. It's a bit, yes, it's a bit low. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, is Igbo spirituality idol worship? Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. So is Igbo spirituality idol worship? That's a very interesting question, and it's one that has been um, going on um, for quite a while since the advent of uh, Christianity in Nigeria. Um, my, quest, my answer to that is no, it is not idol worship. Um, for that, we need to look at the definition of idols. So an idol is a material representation of a deity, okay, which is used in worship. Now, if you take that definition further into the biblical sense, it is an image. The idol... <laughs> Not fight. The idol um, is a material representation of a deity, yes. which is used in worship. Taking that definition further into biblical sense, it is the image and image of a deity other than God. So hold a thought for a second whilst we explore briefly Igbo spirituality, which is the understanding the nature of existence, the nature of consciousness, the nature of the self and soul. Now, central to Igbo spirituality is the concept of God, Chiuku, the great spirit. Chiuku is the totality or the aggregation of all chis. Chi, all elements, all objects, everything in creation has a chi. I have a chi. He has a chi. Everyone in this audience has a chi. It is part and parcel of God. The inanimate object as well. The abstractions, this chair has a chi. The floor has a chi. The roof of this building has a chi. Even abstract concepts have a chi. Which means that nothing, absolutely nothing, can exist outside of God, Chugu. Chukwu is the aggregation of all the chis. And central to Igbo spirituality is that idea of a unity of creation. Now let's explain a little bit what we see when someone is worshipping an idol. Uh, with due respect, he's, he's actually speaking as loud as he can. Can we just, maybe if we kept quiet, we'd, listen, we'd hear him. Because it's, we're interrupting him, please. Thank you. 
please, can we just let him ca carry on? I beg you, because these interruptions don't, don't help us. Thank you so much. Thank you. So when we're talking, when we move away from that background I've given you of their conception of the spirituality in summary, let's now look at prayer, right? Someone is standing in front of a statue or carving in supplication to a deity or an energy or what have you. We need to understand what the prayer is all about. Now, the Igbo prayer has a standard format. There will be the throwing of chok, nzu. There will be the breaking of a colonnade. There will be the offering, whether it be food item or sacrifice. And finally, there's a libation being poured. Now, if you go into the prayer itself, he will invoke God first. He's inviting God, the supreme being, to you know, partake of the throne of chalk. Now, the symbolism of that throne of chalk is, Nzu is peace, is purity, is spirit. I come to the spirit in peace and purity and love through the Nzu with me, which means meet me in that space of worship with your best and highest qualities. Now he starts from Chuku and talks about and then invites the abstractions like Anya Wonobosi, the daylight and the day, and starts listing the various energies, the Holy Spirit, which is Nawu, Idemili, God's daughter, and continues, goes through the entire list of energies, inanimate objects that he can remember. And at the end, he would say, That is, let everything congregate. Let all of creation congregate. If I name you, if I call you, call your kith and kin, come and join me through Nzu. Let us meet ourselves in a space of love and purity. Okay? Once that happens, he then breaks the collar knot. What he's doing in essence, he's communing with all of creation. Now I ask you, what is all of creation? That is God, Chiyuku. He's not praying to an idol. He's communing with the totality of creation. Yes, he may want to work with a certain aspect of God, a certain energy of God. Maybe he wants to address his ikenga, which is the divine archetypal masculine force. But that prayer to ikenga, or that request to ikenga, would start with a supplication to God and all of creation. That none of them exist outside of God. The other thing I want to talk about, still within this topic, is the fact that the worshiper themselves or himself or herself, realizes that what he's doing is not worshiping an idol. Because the Igbos have a saying that um, I'll translate that. Ufike is the non-dibia, the non-magical person. For those of you who are into popular culture and you've read Harry Potter, the nearest equivalent I could, you know, Call an Ufik is a muggle, a non magical person. So the point is, a non magical person or the unenlightened one picks up the carving of a deity and believes he has carried a deity. He's wasting his time. That hunk of wood is not a deity. If you want that deity, you go into God. That is where the deity resides. And therefore, the worshipper knows this. In this manner, you understand that they're not worshipping idols. They know that they're not worshipping an idol, right? Now, with the advent of colonialism and the early missionaries, they can be forgiven for believing that what they're seeing is idol worship because they didn't have access to the knowledge of what was going on. You can observe 
someone praying at their shrine, praying in front of their grove. But unless you understand what they're doing, you can only describe it in terms of what you see. And Igbo spirituality is rife with layers of meaning. You might find this meaning I'm sharing with you very deep, but I assure you that in some areas, it's even far deeper, right? So in that sense, sorry, I was, I was looking no, at the please, audience. Please, please, please. I think it's a very important um, issue to sort of address. So in that sense, it is in no way the worship of an idol. Even if I were to pray to this, I don't know, microphone stand, this has a chi, God is inside here. God is, you know, it contains God, an element of God. And if I'm speaking to this, God is hearing me. It is not idol worship. In the same way, God does not live in a house. We call, well, people refer to church as the house of God. So I ask you, does it mean if you step, out of the, step outside of a church, God is no longer with you? It's preposterous. So in that sense, I hope I've given you food for thought to understand that it is in no means, it's by no means idol worship. It's been derided by, you know, as idol worship, animism. And again, what I mean, I would just, I would um, sort of cut some slack to Western, you know, visitors, right, who call this animism, purely because we believe that everything has a soul or everything has a chi. What they're lacking perhaps is how we view the way all these things that have a chi, how we, you know, how we interact with them. We don't interact with an object outside of the others. If I'm interacting with this object, I'm interacting with all of creation. If I'm interacting with this object, I'm interacting with all of creation. And therefore, if I'm praying to Amadioha here, I'm not praying to Amadioha as a deity. I'm praying to God. If I'm praying to, I don't know, Ahobinago, I'm not praying to I'm, I'm praying to God because we're all interconnected. And that's the fundamental difference in the thought patterns of the African, of the Igbo man, as distinct from Western thought patterns, which is, which, you know, it tends to categorize things without giving it much. Now, I'm making a generalization here, so forgive me, but it tends to put things in a category. This is that. You're praying to this particular deity, and this deity is different from that deity. These are all aspects of the same force, and all these forces are aspects of God, as you are. So I hope, uh, I suppose, I've, I've addressed that question. Yeah, but you've raised other questions, and uh, I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Now, the next question is, because you've, okay, you've not, what you've now told us is that idolatry is a fallacy. That's the notion of idolatry in the book of, you know, the, idolatry, the, the notion of idolatry as the overarching feature of Igbo spirituality is, is a fallacy. Now, I'm going to ask you then, because you've now, you've made extensive reference to the Godhead. Chiyuku. Now, you also talk about the deities. Can you be a bit more expansive about the channel of, is that an hierarchy? The channels of communication between the deities, between man, the deities, and Chuku. A bit more expand, because you've actually, what you've done is you've titillated the audience, because now they can't get their eyes off this microphone stand. <laughs> so if you could assist us by, you know, that relationship between the Chuku, the, de the various deities as they exist, and indeed man. Just a bit of, a bit of background as to the structure. Okay, that's fine. So when we talk of Chuku, as I mentioned, Chuku is the supreme spirit. Chi is spirit. It is the aggregate of all the chis. Chuku is invoked or praised, or addressed, if you like, as Okikechi Okikowa. The sharer that shared chi, the creator of the world. The cutter or the splitter of things, the creator of things. What did it split? What did it cut? It split itself. And that's why you have chi in every quantum, every part of creation. 
if you're looking at relationship with deities and hierarchy, that is a subject that might take us a lifetime to complete. But I will try to address it. Chiku. which is the totality of all things, has given function to all manner of creation, right? And every element of creation is allocated a chi in accordance with the function God wants it to do. At the apex of creation, we've got, at the, at the apex of creation, of God's creation, we've got Nagu, which leading authorities in this field deem the Holy Spirit. You also have the daughter of God, Idemili, Isisi, or Isis, Akete, or Igwe. That is the great goddess. And I must mention, um, even though we uh, refer to Chukwu as a he, that's a more recent thing. The orig original Igbo spirituality, Chukwu is a woman. <laughs> the age old, the age old, the Igbo people are the original people in the world. That is what, and it is not a flippant statement. You would see elements, fundamental element, elements of Igbo spirituality in all ancient cultures in the world. I'll give you an example. Anubis, the god of death in Egypt, one of the oldest gods of Egypt, is Anubi Isinkita. In Igbo spirituality, that is Anubi, the dog-headed deity. What does it signify? It is death. Because Anubi Sinkita emerged from Abasi, the bag of hatred. So, I think I had someone sort of, um, someone sort of um, wasn't very impressed with the statement that God is a woman. I think I'll elaborate on that. So the world has gone through so many ages. The patriarchy is more or less a recent thing. In the age, throughout the ages of the world, God, in the very original sense, was deemed a woman. God is a force. God is pure spirit, right? It is genderless in the true sense of the word. However, as we live on the earth plane, the earth plane is a duality. We must assign it a gender. And in the original Igbo spirituality, God is a woman. It was at the advent of the age of the um, age of Ikenga, Agalinabo, that we changed God to a man. But the key spirit at the apex of the creation, the Trinity, is a woman. Nago, Udiobala, Obala, Anwawo, the deathless light, and Usobala, the sun woman. That's a Trinity, all women. God's dotty, Demmili. That's a woman. And even now we've moved into the patriarchy where we refer to God as a he. Original Igbo Debias that are worth their salt will tell you that that is a contradiction in terms because chi, by definition, is a creative force. That is a female energy. And that is why Igbo say, inwe chi, you're lucky. But inwe oke chi, male chi, you're, you know, you're unlucky. So therefore, if chi is a female energy, the total aggregation of the female energy cannot be a man. So don't get so attached to those labels. When someone says God is a woman or God is a man, you start shouting, no. <laughs> Let's understand it for what it is. It is pure spirit, but for the purposes of us dwelling in this world, it's a world of duality, therefore we need to understand it in that manner. 
Okay, so back to your question. I'm sorry, I, just, I did digress. Um, I did digress. Um, your question up, uh, 10 minutes, okay. We need to, okay, that's fine. Right, okay. So um, when we talk about the hierarchy of um, spirits, this is too, it, it's too wide for me to go into here, but I've just given you um, that trinity, right? Which, has, which is at the apex of creation, and whose function is to channel God's energy to the world. Chuku is Chuku Abia Ama. Abia is knowledge and wisdom. Ama is revelation. So Chuku, Chuku Abia Ama is the supreme being. The hidden knowledge and wisdom that reveals itself through the agency of Agu, Agu the spirit that controls creation. Within the Agu spirits, you have the Muzi, the muses that inspire mankind. So God reveals his knowledge and wisdom through these spirits. The spirits are still part and parcel of God. Don't see them as outside of God because they're not. The Igbo also say that if you have it inside, you can also go directly to God. You don't need to go through anyone. Again, that comes back to the unity of creation. I'm so excited. I almost forgot to pick up my microphone. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for that. That was, I mean, um, I, I could not possibly ask you a full-on question. But usually I have full-on questions. I need to unraveling. I don't need to. I'll leave that to the audience because you certainly answered mine. But I'm going to go on to the next question now, which <laughs> it's important because we have a variety of of backgrounds, you know, of uh, theological dispositions in this hall. Yeah. So it's important that we look at the various sides to this. Now, predominantly uh, in, in Igbo land, yes. Christian, the, the Christian theology was the, became the most influential, or the more influential, you know, uh, as after, 19, after 1901, or should I say after 18, 1857, you know, Christian theology obviously spread its wings. So it is important to now do now ask a question. It appears there are structural similarities between Igbo and Christian theology. Is that correct? And uh, also, on the alternative, I know this is, you probably will understand the question, because obviously what you've done, what, one thing you've very clearly highlighted is the, the need for us to break away from that binary reasoning, which is a precept of the introduced, or should I say, the foreign bodies in our midst. But then, it is important for us to ask this question. What are the structural similarities between Igbo and Christian theologies? Thank you for that question. Um, before I answer that question, I will answer that question, but before I do, I think it's very important to set the context. Um, when you're comparing similarities between two objects, I think there is an underlying supposition, an assumption that they're on equal footing. They're not. Let me just make that clear. <laughs> Igbo spirituality, the Igbos deem themselves the original people in the world. And as I said before, it is not a flippant statement. So it far predates, by far, all these religions that we have today. Okay? So, I would call what I'm saying, I will I'll call what I'm saying a listing of Igbo spiritual, spiritualist elements in the Christian world. So the first one is the belief in a supreme being. I think I've spoken a bit at length about Chiyuku. There's also the concept of Trinity in Christianity. This is not new in Igbo spirituality at all. I just discussed um, the fact that Nago, which is at the apex of God's creation, is a trinity. Nago is the Holy Ghost in Igbo spirituality and is the mother of Ab Obala. Just, to, um, just a quick step back. Agu is Aguagu, endlessness, infinity. And Igbo say that Aguadehe, Madagu, without Agu, 
in existence, humanity is finished. So that tells you the importance of this force in keeping the wheels of creation running and turning to enable you know, the souls of man to incarnate and gain experience for the evolution. I digress. So back to it. It is a trinity because it is um, uh, in the original mystical language. Its name is Udiobala, right? It is the mother of Obala, the deathless light, right? And the deathless light itself, or the sun, is mother to Anyawanyaw, which is the sun woman. So that is the trinity at the apex of creation. Now within Nagu itself, Nagu itself is a trinity. There's Agu Mili, which is the Agu that reveals knowledge of how to control the weather. There's Agu Dibia, which is the Agu that reveals the knowledge of divination. And there's a, um, sorry, Agu Dibia, I, I, I apologize. It is the Agu that reveals knowledge of herbs and plants in the forest. And a Biancata is the Agu that reveals knowledge of divination. So there's a trinity within a trinity. It is a concept that is central to Igbo spirituality. See what I mean? So to my mind, this is even is far more complete than new, you know, the other, you know, Christianity, which is perhaps a later religion, right? Uh, I don't know whether we haven't got a lot of time for this, but I would have delved into the fact um, that. Uh, in Igbo, in Igbo numerology, three is a very important number. Right? It's a number of stability. Igbo say, which means when you have three pillars, the stability, the pot sits and simmers. And tonto is knowledge, which is three into three. That is nine. And nine is the number of the Dibia, the adept or the master of wisdom and knowledge. And once you move beyond nine, which is the master, number of self-mastery, you get into 10. Numerolo numerologically speaking, 10 is one, which brings you back to God, unity of creation. So that's the first, um, I would say, similarity we've got. But I think uh, there's, a superior uh, there's a superior concept at work here. Yes, in Christianity, you do have the um, concept of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. I think it's here. Um, <clears throat> and then the third bit is uh, the concept of immortality. I think the Christian faith believes uh, in the immortal soul. And when people um, pass on, they, um, sorry, I'm not an expert in Christian um, religion, so forgive me if I just speak about this thing in very general terms. When you pass on, you... Um, join God in heaven or you go to hell depending on how you know, um, you've lived your life. In Igbo spirituality, you do have the belief in the mortality of the soul. But it goes further. It goes further to explain the concept of, uh, of uh, reincarnation. So the human soul is not restricted to one life on earth. Whatever you reap, you, whatever you sow, you will reap. If you sow good, you will reap goodness. If you sow evil or discord, you will reap, reap you know, terrible repercussions over lifetimes. Yes, within the Christian faith, you know, there is the belief that um, uh, you had the Redeemer, Christ the Redeemer, who came to redeem you know, the world of its sins. And if you believe, if whosoever believes is saved, you will not be you know, um, cast into hellfire. We don't have that. Whatever you do, we believe in the concept of divine justice. Whatever you do, you will pay for it. If not in this lifetime, over a series of lifetimes, so to me, that is an even more complete concept, you know, conception, of, conception of immortality rather than, okay, you know, I, I don't know, become a serial killer 
and suddenly if I believe in Jesus, all my sins are forgiven and that's it, I won't pay repercussions. Yeah, God is love, yes, we believe that. You'll be forgiven, but you're going to pay for things you've done. <laughs> that is it. So, uh, so, so that's another, I, mean, I wouldn't call it a similarity, I would call it an extension of an idea or the, you know, a complete idea. I mean, because I, th I think it's I think it's, it's more or less the same thing because one way or another, even there's a concept of purgatory in in Christian theology, and uh, you know, even though you know you might your imaginal case, but you still have to be purged of your should I say of your iniquity before passing over to the uh, to, to 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 heaven. So there is a, there is some similarity, but I'm I'm going to I'm sorry I'm going to have to truncate you there. Okay. Um, <laughs> but you, but I think I think the point is generally made. Um, I'm going to move on now because we look at the contemporary context. Because, you know, we, look, I was speaking as an historian. Yeah. I, we've seen the trajectory, you know, of the traditional, as they say, traditional religion, you know, but the, should I say the pure spiritual, evil spirituality is what I would prefer to call it, transitioned into the present day, you know. And I know certainly what, what my grand, great-grandfather, I know what, how my great-grandfather worshipped. I knew how, what my, how my grandfather worshipped because he became a Christian in the 1920s, because he had to get into DMGS, first of all, but later on he, he imbibed it, because you know, there were, there were certain teasers that were given to us to, to cross over. Anyway, in the contemporary context, my question is double-headed. Is there a place for this, for Igbo spirituality? Is there a, does it have a place in the contemporary context? Is there, and, uh, amongst our kin? It's an obvious question. I know your, your question is, your answer is obvious. <laughs> but then, sec, the second part is yeah. this. Do you see or have you witnessed a renaissance or reawakening of our people to our original spirituality? That's my final question. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. I think uh, I'll take the initial one, the first one, which is, is there a place for Igbo spirituality in the contemporary you know, world? Well... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I would. Uh, I should invite someone from the audience to answer that question because. Um... <laughs> yes. My father, for example, um, is a scholar. is a university don. Even if I say so myself, he studied at the universities of Cambridge and London. Right. He's a Dibia, a practicing Dibia. But if you see him, you'll never guess. My grandfather was one of the um, early educated ones, and he worked as a clerk during the colonial period. And if you see him in his um, full white get-up of a you know, country hat, a sun hat, you know, and a safari suit, one of the first people who had you know, a bicycle then, in the you know, 19, I think, I believe it was 1919 or something, or the early, at the turn of the century, you would never guess. I never met him, but when I'm told, or when I'm, you know, I understand the, the depth and extent of his knowledge, a lot of which he refused to teach my father, purely because he thought that we live in the age, in the Igbo age of um, Ogazi, which is a very destructive age, and therefore we are not fit to have some of the deeper knowledge transmitted to us. So, very much so. And I suppose to address it to perhaps people who are not very familiar with the forms and moods of practice, um, Igbo spirituality doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a grove, a shrine, etc. right? There are different forms of prayer. Your prayer can be ritualistic in nature. There's also unspoken prayer. And there's also ikumindo, taking in the breath of life, which is like the orient... Which it is, it is asserted that the Oriental cultures learned from us. When you are, you know, inhaling, doing the umendu, you are inhaling prana, your chi life force. And when you're doing that, you're reconnecting to all there is, to all of creation. That doesn't, need a, you don't need a shrine for that. You can do it out there. You can sit in the park. You can sit in your car and do that. So Igbo spirituality shouldn't be put in a box. As God is the totality of creation, the forms of worship of God as diverse as creation itself. Even, I mean, 
it was only until I got into Igbo spirituality that I learned that there are prayers that are there are unspoken prayers or wordless prayers. Which, if you're pure, if your hands are clean, can be more powerful than any magic in the entire universe. Because you're connecting right back to God. Stripping out every, I suppose, every layer, material layer you have. You're connecting spirit to spirit. So, there, uh, so I, I mean, um, it, it, I think it's a good message to get out there that Igbo spirituality isn't something, and it's, it's rather ignorant to um, deem it animism, deem it idol worship. You need to understand what it is and understand the deep values in it. And as you, you know, advance in those deep valleys, you realize that this contains, I mean, almost everything you can think of. So yes, it is very much so um, a contemporary practice. And the, just a final point on that, some of the Debia, the adepts or experts in knowledge and wisdom, they're like you and I. They're hidden in plain sight. It's not the things you see on TV, uh, this dramatic, you know, people jingling and jangling and have, you know, it's, there's a place, a time and place for that. But that's, you know, it's, when you sit down and speak to some of their highly educated, highly intelligent, erudite scholars who have a deep idiomatic grasp of their language, of the English language and other languages, and most importantly, the language of the universe, the mystic Afa language, which encompasses all the languages spoken on earth and yet to be spoken on earth. But I think I go too far. If you want to, <laughs> we don't have the time for that right now. But yeah, so the second question, the last question is about um, the Renaissance. I think that's a wonderful question. And one which I asked personally speaking. Um, if you cast your minds back to, I mean, you must have been reading the news and been following popular culture where it's been touted that we are now living in, well, we are at the, dawn of a, we're in the, at the dawn of a new age, the age of Aquarius. And you might wonder, what is the age of Aquarius? It is the age of enlightenment. Um, and for those of you who were around in London, uh, well, anywhere you were in the world, much was made of the fact that the Mayan calendar was going to end um, on the 21st of December, 2012. And there was so much speculation. Does this mean that the world was going to end? Blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> I asked a question of, I asked this question of, of my father. What is going to happen on December 21st, 2012? Is the world really going to end? He looked at me and laughed and just said, no, it's not going to end. On t December 21st, 2012, the world is entering into Ogao, the age of the sun. during which things that have been hidden over the ages will be revealed in the light of day. So yes, there is a renaissance <laughs> happening because the truth will be gradually revealed. Age-old truth that's been hidden for ages will be gradually revealed. And as we sort of demonstrate ourselves to be worthy of that, we will be availed of the truth. And I mean, this is a testament of that renaissance. I'm quite surprised that I have this many people in the audience coming to listen to this topic. I really believed it was going to be a handful of you know, people. It, it, does, it does testify to um, the pursuit of knowledge, which is commendable in all of you, each and every one of you in the audience. And it does you know, speak to that renaissance. And so I do hope that this, uh, this tidbit I've shared here I mean, I, 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 I do hope that it snowballs into something far more positive and something greater than ourselves. Absolutely. Really. And please understand that I'm not here to castigate your religion or your deeply held beliefs. I'm here to explain and give you insights into the spirituality of the Igbos, which has been wrongly castigated, which has been wrongly dismissed. And I'm here to tell you what it is and give you food for thought. Now, if you want to research deeply, you can refer to the leading experts on leading authorities in the field, right? There's so many books on this. Books, you know, by my father, Professor Emeritus Umi. Now, I'm not plugging his books, you know, but this is just to let you know that you do have things out there 
you need to have that thirst for knowledge. He didn't bring, you know, he didn't sit me down and start teaching me things. I took that interest. And it's an interest that is going to be, it's, it's going to live in me as long as I live. And I do encourage you to take a lot more interest in things to do with your culture. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard it. I mean, I don't think there's absolutely nothing to add. add. The only thing I would say is uh, we have a name for people like this gentleman here. You know, I'm really, I mean, talk about, you know, there's so much knowledge there, which we've only, even, we've only scratched the surface. So we have, you know, any questions out in the, uh, the audience? I think it's a gentleman out there or a lady. All right. So who's going to pass the microphone to her? Hi. Um, oh, gosh. Thank you so much. Um, uh, my name is Cordelia Okoye. Um, I'm um, so happy to just hear this amazing talk. Um, I, I saw your last name, Ume, and I thought, oh my gosh, could he be the son or relative of um, this professor? Who? Because I actually emailed your dad like about a month ago or, or two months ago because um, his books are really hard to find at the moment. As a matter of fact, um, I think, isn't he the one who wrote um, um, God is Dibia or? After God is Dibia. After God is Dibia, yes, great. So you are the, okay. So, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the reason why I'm so excited is because, and I'm so happy that I think that this was like law of attraction, is that the books currently online, it's really hard to find them. And at the moment right now, After God is Dibia currently is like over $1,000 on Amazon right now because there's only like one or two copies that are, can be found. So I actually emailed your dad and I said, hi, you don't know me, but here's my name and I'm from Nebraska. And I just wondered if possibly, you know, I, we could, there's a way I could, we could find your books. And he said he would send me some. I know it's hard because it's coming from Nigeria, but um, I just wondered how, because this is really, there's actually, at the moment right now, there's a huge renaissance, particularly amongst um, those of us in the diaspora who want to get in touch with the, with the culture, and the best way to get in touch with the culture, obviously, is with the language, which we've struggled with in the diaspora, but also with the religion, the traditional religion, which has been maligned. And many of our um, parents' generation have kind of, um, I wouldn't say that they're trying to push us away from the traditional religion, but there's a lot of... Maybe because of their upbringing in like the missionary schools, there's a lot of fear about, um, you know, this is um, juju or this is um, black magic or, you know, everybody has that relative in your family who nobody shakes their hand because they do like, they're in this cult or that cult. And the thing is, I feel like as somebody who was born abroad and who's been disconnected, myself and my siblings, we, we, I know I'm kind of instinctively that there's this, this is a way because... Um, many, many, many African, African Americans, Nigerian Americans, other Americans abroad, for example, I'm speaking, speaking from the US point of view, we kind of know that we're getting attracted to the religion, but we don't know how to we get, get the information. Some of these books are in some libraries, but it's very hard to find, for example, After God is Dibia in, in particular. I mean, that one at the moment right now, you can check it online, Amazon.com, sorry, that it is over $1,000 right now. So I just wondered if there's any way you could any advise on this. Thank you. Sorry for the long. Let's take the next question. Next question. <laughs> okay. Um, why don't we sort of um, catch up um, after this um, sort of forum, if that's okay? You, we can um, exchange yes, details. My, my name is Innocent Abonyi. Um, I want to say something about the Renaissance, the last question you asked him. Um, in 2014, I had the privilege of attending a conference in Burkina Faso. And that conference was to discuss and to come out with some kind of materials that will form a curriculum for the teaching of African traditional religion, which is known as ATL right. in academia then. I don't know. And then that was it. And before that conference, there were some other conferences as well in some other places. But I had to attend this one. 
I don't know whether that eventually saw the light of day, but just to say that even this, this forum, this gathering, is, is also a renaissance of some sort. Our people don't know much about ATR, they don't know much about our religion, um, and that's, that's one point. So there's some renaissance coming. Maybe someday the material that, were, uh, that came out of those conferences will be introduced in universities and secondary schools. Because ATR is a religion of its own, in its own right. The same way we teach uh, Islam and Christianity, so it should be taught as well, in some way. Th thank, you very, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that um, comment. Just one thing to state. Um, I don't, it would be good for us to um, always um, bear in mind that um, what we're discussing here is not just religion, it's spirituality, which is it encompasses far more than religion. Religion is more or less the knowledge which has been reduced into dogma, right? So they might call it ATR, that's fine, but I would encourage people to look at African spirituality or Igbo spirituality, which has a value system that drives everything you do, not just when you kneel down to pray, okay? So thank you for your comments. I really appreciate that. Um, I mean, I'm not taking credit for it, but I do agree with you, but I just want us to broaden that definition. Let's not reduce it to ATR. It isn't a religion. It's far more than that. Yeah. Okay, I've got a question. Um, like you said, most of our families were forced to cross over, and most of us now belong to different religions. And the first time I met, I know your family very well, and I always thought, how... Um, how is it possible that some members of your family are able to belong to other religion as well as do the evil religion? Have you got any advice? Because I am a Christian myself and I've got a son and I would w really want to educate him um, in evil spirituality, but also how can you combine the two? Because this is the reality of the world that we live in now. And with all the work that's being done in quantum physics, if you actually, it's now the evidence is that everything is basically the same. So what advice would you give me in terms of how can I bring up my son? I don't want him to grow up in the ignorance in which I grew up in. Because the first time that I learned that your dad was a Dibia, I actually laughed. But now I'm laughing at my own ignorance. So how do I make sure that my son doesn't grow up as ignorant as I've, I've, I've grown up? Thank you. I think she deserves a round of applause. For the very last statement she made, uh, that um, when she heard my father was a DBS, she laughed, but now she understands that she was laughing at her own, own ignorance. I think it takes a great uh, strength of character to admit when you're wrong and, you know, to sort of, and that is the very first step, step to learning, understanding that you know nothing. Even what I think I know here, it is, you know, is nothing compared to what people like my father and perhaps the sages of the old uh, knew. Um, my advice to you and perhaps your, you know, and to your son is, first of all, uh, make the library your friend. It's that reading, right? You need to inculcate in the children a thirst for knowledge. Shut down that TV, that television isn't helping you. Limit the time. I mean, I don't have children yet, but you know, these are the rules I applied to myself and our father applied, my father applied to us. Go pick up a book, leave, up, leave that TV. He'll leave you with, you know, it's your choice, you know, what reading material you pick up, so long as it's educational, is insightful, is entertaining, but not dross. So the very first step is educating yourself on the subject. Read far and wide. Within that um, subject area, there must be some things that pique his curiosity you know, his interest. Um, then the other thing I needed to address is your um, concern. How do you mix them? When you say how you mix them, it presupposes that they're different. I, I hope I made myself clear when I said, when you're comparing the two um, schools of thought, it, you know, let's not go with the assumption that this one and the same thing. One predates the other. In fact, there is nothing you find in Christianity that you don't find in Igbo spirituality and more. So it is a more complete version of original spirituality because that is the revealed knowledge from God himself. 
So if when you, I, I suppose when your son gets reading, and your and you read as well yourself, you should direct his reading by that basic premise. It isn't one or the other. We are not, and we, let us not use any other religion to try and lend, lend credence to you know, African spiritual, Igbo spirituality. Like I said, Igbo spirituality, the fundamental tenets are found in all original, civil, all original cultures in the world. And Igbos have, them, have it that they're the original people in the world, right? We're the first ones, Ndembo. Tell that to your son. And if all else fails, bring him to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's, um, it's wonderful to actually have you here because some of the things you have been saying, I've been saying for a long time, but I've been almost talking to myself. Um, there is a, a concept because you've talked about God and in Western religion, God has a nemesis called the devil. And one of the things that really hurts me is the fact that we have now come to equate the devil with Ekwensu. Now, it is my belief that these two things are actually different. What is your take on that? Thank you very much. Thank you for that um, question. It is something um, that is one of the fallacies or one of the misconceptions about um, Igbo spirituality. In Igbo spirituality, we do not have the concept of the devil. The entity or the energy called Ekwensu is not the devil. It is addressed, Ekwensu go tubula jawa. It is the beautiful eagle that pecks to death the evil snake. Would the devil be pecking to death, you know, its fellow evil? No. It is, I wouldn't even call it an, an approximation. It is a wrong, it's a concept that's just been turned on its head and utilized uh, you know, by Christianity. So no, Equinsu is not devil. Now the Igbos do recognize that they're evil spirits, but they're not Equinsu. Evil spirits, they're myriad. You have Ndiobonuke, peers who have crossed over and are causing confusion. You have Obodinana, abomination you know, that occurred, you know, Ages ago, creating trouble. Amusumu, amusumad. Omona dino monanze. Demons. But you have, you know, ndino ni jitenabo. People between the planes, they haven't fully crossed over. They are stuck between the earth plane and the astral. And in frustration, they're acting out against, you know, people on earth. So the list is endless. And it also tells you that you can defeat all those demons rather than something to be feared. Oh, the devil is here. What do I do? No, you have dominion to fight against such things, wreaking havoc, havoc in your life or wreaking havoc around. However, Ekwensu is not devil. Okay? Ekwensu is the beautiful eagle that pecked the evil snake to death. It is a god of war which has achieved countless victories. That is what Equinsu is. Mm. Um, thank you, sirs, for your, your discourse today. Um, I now know why I came from America <laughs> to this London for my first time. Um, so I came into, I came away from Christianity and into Ebo spirituality via your father's book some 10 years ago. Um, since then, I've found Taoism. And I have a Taoist teacher and I have a Dibia teacher. And the two walk hand in hand in terms of medicine. It's very, it's quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> so I just, that's just to let people know that this is a real thing. Just in 
China, they accept their medicine people, and in Nigeria, we seem to still reject ours. Um, that has to change. But in the context of what I want to ask you is, a lot of people acknowledge, say, Egypt, ancient Egypt, or what they call Kemet, as the fountainhead of spirituality. Um, but it was through your father's works, I saw the correlations and some of the examples you gave today, like the Anubis, um, some correlations of this Igbo idea that predates even that. But my question is, where do you find these sources that are, because the Yorubas, people know about Yoruba medicine because they have more of a written tradition. Igbos tend to be more oracular, um, oral tradition. So for those of us who are starving for this information to flesh it out for the others and for ourselves, where would you uh, lead us? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, the short answer is, if you're searching for knowledge, search everywhere. Ochihena chona ngiga. Ngiga is, um, what's the explanation now? It, it, it's a basket where, um, it's kept in the kitchen uh, where you dry spices and fish. So it's, it's an obscure, if you're looking for your, if you're searching for your watch, for example, you know, clearly it wouldn't be in there, but you know, because you're searching frantically, please look there as well, it could be there. Yeah. So that's the approximation. So you search everywhere. Um, even when you get to Igbo land, assuming you've got um, the time and the resources to do that, because I know that this is difficult, um, I think we need to understand that the oracular tradition is a way or a vehicle or a mechanism by which this hidden knowledge has been protected for ages. And it's not something for sale. It is not something that will be shared. The path of the Dibya, for example, is a path to self-mastery. To become an adept in hidden knowledge and wisdom is a journey of a lifetime, all lifetimes. Divination, for example, if someone agrees to teach, teach you divination, it will take at least 20 years for you to become a competent apprentice. Competent apprentice. So you need to develop friendships of that last a lifetime. And the such friendships, they'll be testing. You'd, you know, undergo test of metal. Have you got the character for us to share this knowledge with you? What are you going to do with it? And even if you've got the character for us to share the knowledge, is it safe to do so? What if you share it with someone else? If that person wreaks havoc with it, you would have to live with the guilt. We'd have to live with the guilt. Well, I say we, I'm, I'm not, you know. You see what I mean? Right, so the only thing is keep, you know, keep searching. Speak, to, go to Nigeria, go to you know, Igbo land, you know, talk to people. You would always get tidbits, but do not expect that you know, if you spend a month or a year, you, know, you come away and become a Dibya, or you come away with oh, you know, full knowledge. No, that's not gonna happen. Start reading to start with. You know, it's, it's the tradition, it's you know, the mechanisms for sharing knowledge in Igbo spirituality is built in such a way that you get to know, you get to learn what you need to know. They will share things with you on a need, purely need to know basis. They don't care if you think they're stupid. They don't care if you think they're not very bright. It is on a need to know basis. And for me, even myself, sometimes when I you know, ask certain questions, it's not forthcoming. And then years later, the answer comes, and I'm thinking, well, why didn't you share it with me then? But, but it's, it, it's just to let you know, it's, this, it's a journey of a lifetime to sort of learn this, and you have to be immersed in the culture. But, you know, uh, the leading authorities have done fantastic work in curating some of this language and, you know, sharing as much as possible. So I enjoin you to, you know, pick those things up, try to discuss them, and when they see interest, they're more willing to share more with you. And I hope this helps you on your journey and your search for knowledge. But it's very commendable that you're doing this. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a round of applause. Uh,